Brave Little Belgium. This is a two-player game about the opening phases of the Great War. We have the Germans that are demanding that the Belgians let them go through their country so they can go and invade France. So the Belgians say no and the Germans attack. Hence the game. In this game one player will control the Germans, attacking Germans, and the other player will control a coalition of Belgian forces and then French and English allies. It is a completely non-symmetrical situation because of the objectives, because of the forces involved. The Germans are many and they are strong and they're gonna come in heavy, inflicting a lot of pain on the, Germ on the Belgians and then the Belgians and their allies are going to try to put themselves together and to slow down the advance as much as possible. So very different situation and very different uh, objectives. The Germans simply have to make this mighty advance and they are running against the clock. They only have a limited number of turns in which they can do so. So on one hand they have the resources but on the other they also have um, the burden of the attack and they do need to be efficient to be able to accomplish all their goals by the end of the game. Two player game as I said but also perfectly playable by a solitaire player that wants to control both sides at the best of their possibilities as a way to see the strategy, to experience history. Also it is definitely a very simple game. It can definitely work as an introductory war game. If you never played a war game, this is going to be your first war game. I don't think you're going to be overwhelmed at all. I think this is going to be a nice smooth introduction into this fascinating, fascinating side of the gaming hobby. But without further ado, let me show you how Brave Little Belgium works. Here you see the board of the game which is printed on cardstock and it lays flat quite well. It represents the area of the confrontation. It is, as you can see, a point-to-point -point map. That means that game pieces will sit in the locations that you see here and will use these connections to move from one area to the next. The allies start pretty much all over the place uh, with some units that have a designated setting location and some units that will be placed randomly using this table here. But they are, they are a little bit here, a little bit there because actually that makes sense because they're trying to cover and to defend as large an area as they can. Large German armies will arrive from this side of the map and they will start pushing and destroying things and moving in this direction as fast as they can. There are several special locations on the map that are fortresses, we'll talk about those, and the German player needs to destroy two of them. Also the German player needs to place an infantry unit past this dotted line here. If the German player manages to do all those three things, place an infantry unit there and destroy two of the fortresses, two specific fortresses, before the game is over, then the German player wins the game, otherwise the allied player wins the game. And so what the allied player is trying to do is to delay, to delay the advance of the German player as much as possible. Now, an interesting thing that we have here is the atrocities tracks. Historically, the Germans weren't particularly kind to Belgian people, but of course, the more atrocities they committed, the worse it was for them in terms of PR. So they got a bad reputation. During the game, uh, players will activate their units using activation chests that are randomly drawn from a cup. We'll, I'll give you more details later. But suffice to say that if the German player doesn't get to activate all of their armies in a turn, the German player can choose to activate some of the armies that remained inactive, in which case the player rolls a die on a roll of four or more the player gets to activate the army indeed, but also the cost of committing one atrocity. The LA player also wins if the German player commits five atrocities. I guess, at that point, I guess the, the public opinion is so uh, against Germans that, well, that causes them major, major damage to their reputation and to their position in the starting war. 
we were talking about about these activation markers here you place them in the cup they will not all be in the cup at the beginning of the game because not all units get to activate the French units activate after a couple of turns the English units even later the general idea is that when you draw an army marker then you get to activate all the units that belong to the group so for example if you activate if you draw that uh, marker there then you get to activate English units and so on and so forth for the other armies so a player doesn't matter which one will draw a marker and then the owning player will get to activate all of the corresponding game pieces and game pieces are coded coded by color so for example by drawing this one and you can put it there in the pull sheets then the German player gets to activate units that are marked with that color there like these ones for example then we also have chits representing events when one such cheat is drawn, that doesn't mean that the event happens at that time, but it means that the event is available. So it is placed there in the pull cheat area with the event face up, and then the owning player can choose to use that event whenever appropriate. For example, this one is activated before a German attack, other ones also this is for an attack, other ones are about movement. Like in this case, when the owning player chooses to activate, then the owning player simply implements the effect and the un and the chit st st still stays there, but on the other side. So we know you cannot use that effect again. And then we have end of turn marker. When three of them are randomly pulled from the cup, the turn is over. You start the next turn. All of these chits go back in there. And again, if by the time the third and the turn marker is pulled, the German player hasn't used, hasn't activated all their armies, that is when they get a chance to do so. Military units are represented by uh, these counters here, which are printed on wood, they're made of wood, so very nice, very thick. Also important, when I separated them, they come or attach to one another, they fell off the, the frame easily and there was no suit on the side, so the companies they use um, game pieces made of wood had the problem that then you have to clean them because the edges are super dirty, this was not the case. All right, so uh, these game pieces represent different military units. They will have a symbol that represents the type of unit, cavalry or infantry, and the color tells you the kind of army that they belong to. Also, you have an army here, uh, a number here, connecting the uh, game pieces with their command. Then you have here a number printed on these dice, which simply represents the number to hit. When that unit attacks, well, each unit rolls a die and it scores a hit if it rolls the number or higher. So when attacking, this unit rolls a die and scores a hit on the opponent when with a 4, 5 or a 6, this one with a 5 or a 6. Meta units have a number of steps. Some units have two steps, that means when a unit takes a hit, you flip it to the reduced side and so for example as you can see now this one they used to hit on a four or more only hits on a five or more and this one now would only hit on a six there are however also units that only have one side one step when they take a hit then there is an, a reduced side then you simply remove them also the gag civic the civic guards pretty much the belgian militia these are untried units that have a question marker on their back and these are randomly shuffled at the beginning of the game they also randomly play so they'll end up being in different cities and no one not even the only player knows what those are so when the german player enters one of those areas that is when we have a look at it some of those actually are blank and so if the german player finds out that there is a blank spot then the german player can move can keep moving otherwise well you have to stop you have to stop there and fight so uh 
pretty much the turn structure is just as simple as, as it can get in a chit pool game. That is, a player will uh, draw a chit, then units of that army will be activated. Units that are activated get to move, and again, you move on these connections. These lines here represent easy connections. They take a single movement point. These other connections here that look a little bit funny, those are hard connections. It takes two movement points. Infantry has two movement points, and infantry has two movement points and cavalry has four movement points and the civic guard does not move. So the activated army gets to move and you know, or none if they so desire, of their game pieces using these connections you have to stop when you enter an area controlled by an enemy and then after all movement is completed you need to fight in all areas where there are game pieces of both players. There is another type of game piece that I haven't showed you yet which is fortress. Fortresses have a number of steps. They don't move as I guess you can imagine So, and they are named so you place them in the location in which they are. Fortresses get to attack, so for example this one would attack, would hit with five or more, the number of dice that they roll in combat is equal to the number of steps that they have, this one for example starts with four, and well, so they can inflict hits on the opponents that are in the there and they're attacking the fortress, they can also take hits for each hit that a fortress takes, it is simply reduced by one step until it loses the last step and it is eliminated. So, uh, pretty much this idea, as we said, you move and after moving you fight. To fight, when you have a large number of units, you may want to move your units to the battle box. Simply because this way you can separate the fighting units by type. Because so this way you have those units there that we have on one side, the units oh, in one area, the units that hit with a four, the units with it with a five, those that hit with a six, and suppose we are fighting against these are the people here, and we also put them this way. This way, when we are rolling, we declare okay, I'm rolling for that cavalry. Nothing. I'm rolling for that infantry. Oh, that's a hit. So I know exactly which die goes with with which unit, which is important since not units have the same number to hit. So both sides will roll their dice and inflict the hits on the opponent simultaneously. Each hit reduces the opponent by one step. There's only one round of combat. After that, the side that took the most hits has to retreat. If there is a tie, it is the attacker that retreats. And this is pretty much most of what you need to know to play the game. A couple of other uh, rules here and there, but this is the idea. Manage to survive for long enough and prevent the Germans from achieving their three objectives. And then, if you are the Entente player, you win the game. Otherwise, the German player completes their objectives and they win the game. I like this game quite a bit. It is a smart little game with an interesting theme, uh, with smart mechanics, nice implementation. Uh, I worry a little bit about replay value maybe, but there are several variants that you can try and more that probably you can come up with that may uh, allow you to keep the game fresh for, for a while. Now, Brave Little Belgium. The mechanics are strong and there are mechanics that I personally like very much in, in Wargaming. You may be aware of this if you watch some of my videos in the past. I love chit pull mechanics. It's just a fun thing, fun idea that gives you unpredictability, uncertainty, fog of war, all of those terrible things that Clausewitz told you that you should expect in warfare, you should expect the unexpected, and uh, chit pull mechanics give you precisely that. You get a sense that you will get to activate uh, almost everybody or a number of people, but who knows. Actually, there are games that, um, that give you more certainty that you'll be able to activate everybody or almost everybody. Here, you may have a turn that's going to be very quick because the end of turn markers come out that fast. And then the German player has, of course, the, uh, the, the, the dilemma whether or not to commit atrocities. 
uh, which is a pretty unsettling element, but it just fits the theme historically. And at the beginning, the German player will go out <laughs> committing atrocities right and left without worrying too much about it, and maybe you commit one, and actually you, you activate an army and you roll, so nothing happens, you activate another army, roll again, nothing happens. And then before you know it, you realize that there is now a bunch of those terrible things that that have piled up uh, on the track and on your conscience, I guess. Uh, and then it starts being a dilemma. Maybe I don't need to activate that army because I don't want to lose the game that way. So that right there is an interesting idea. And I think it's important because, yes, it's a chit pull game, but you don't have so many chits. So um, the fact that the turn may end quickly and the German player may have that choice is really what, what enlivens the, the turn. Otherwise, because it's a small number of chits, um, more or less you can expect what's gonna happen. So I like that the brutal so sudden end of turn that gives more variety to gameplay than the order in which the chits are actually going to come out of the cup. So I like that very much. Combat is so simple, uh, reminds me a lot of, of, uh, of War Games by Columbia War Games with the number to hit, each unit having a single a single die, etc, etc. And I like how simple and quick it is. One round of combat, that's it, and, and then one side has to retreat. That is a smart idea. Also because it balances the fact that sometimes, well, you do have these stacks of units uh, that you're moving around and you want to do so you're concentrating power especially as the German player that means when you're uh, when you're fighting then you have to place them on the display and then that you have to put them back in a pile logistically is not a big deal but you f if you have to go through several rounds of combat then also the implementation of those other things then it would feel a little bit cumbersome but not the case not the case here so combat flows smoothly that way and again and i really like um the objectives and the challenges that the two sides had the first round or two you're gonna think this is the most unbalanced game i've ever played there's no chance that the allies are gonna survive this because the initial uh, the initial hit that the germans inflict is painful and yet, and yet, then the French arrive and they start slowing down and counterattacking. Uh, the, the, the German player will be slowed down. So by connections, it takes a while to travel through all those connections. So actually, um, although I do believe that the LA side is more unforgiving, uh, and so it's harder to play effectively, it seems that the game is fairly balanced. And again, if you find that that is not the case, there are easy ways, there are variants recommended here, and other ways that you can figure out to uh, make life harder for the German player. But definitely making a major mistake um, for uh, the LA player is can be just, can be fatal, so for the LA player, the LA player making a major mistake can be fatal. For the German, maybe you can make two or three. But again, if you delay too long, that can also be a problem. So for a map that is this small, actually there are a lot of interesting puzzles that emerge from where you choose to attack and how and where you choose to uh, to, to allow the opponent to advance a little bit and where you're taking your stand, when you're counterattacking with your French units that are powerful, but then also if you have the temptation of turning it into just a fight of armies as opposed to a fight for territory that can be a mistake too because maybe the opponent is weakened but they reach the dotted line so there are just interesting puzzles here that, that that emerge from the map maybe my concern that i have about replay value is that after all um there are certain there's a certain script that will tend to present itself game after game i don't the game is so small, um, there isn't a lot that you can do that way. You will always start with a mighty attack from from the Germans. You it will be followed by the French trying to to stop the disaster, the catastrophe, and they can do it in slightly different ways. But that is what they have to do. You will see the Germans slowing down and then trying to do the final push. Uh, on one hand, by, by switching sides, you're playing almost two different games because of the complete lack of symmetry. On the other hand, again, the overall script, uh, I don't see it as being very different, radically different from one another, or allowing you to experiment a lot. Uh, yet, another advantage is that, however, you have a game that you can play 
so easily with almost everybody really i think you could play with a child easily um you can use it as an introduction to wargaming for a friend of yours or for yourself and it's a game that is captivating that is fun to play maybe not forever not for a million times but for that bunch of times that you will try i think there is a lot that you can get get out of this game definitely a game that i enjoyed a game that i think is solid fun to play and could be a very good introduction to wargaming brave little belgium